Work hard enough and you will be rewarded is the promise made by video games and basically life. However, several video games actually reward you with a worse ending for putting in the extra effort. And despite getting up early all this week, I have yet to own a single super yacht. Not one. Anyway, last month we covered a bundle of games where the bad ending is harder work than the good one, and the comments blew up with excellent suggestions from excellent commenters. So please enjoy the seven bad endings we got despite working our little socks off, and here comes the spoiler crawl. To be an iconic anime hero, all you need is special powers, a hairdo, and to not pointlessly kill all your friends. Tales of Zillia 2 protagonist Ludger Will Kresnik can't manage all three of these, it turns out, if you rock up to the final act of this action RPG and decide to suddenly swerve off the path to saving humanity. Luger, you came. The issue is, in order to save humanity, Ludger has to reach the mythical land of Canaan. And to do that, he needs to build a soul bridge by sacrificing his brother, Julius. The only upside being, Julius is already doomed, hence his weird hand. So he's reasonably chill about the whole deal. I'm a dead man no matter what. At least this way, my death will mean something to someone. You might consider the best option is to kill Julius in the noble duel he asked for. Then lead your party bravely onward to Canaan over the soul bridge powered by your dead bro. Or if you want to work harder, not smarter, there is another option. Faced with the prospect of sacrificing Julius, you can tell your party, actually, I'm not into that. I'm afraid there's no time. This is such a poor choice, the game actually gives you a chance to take it back. But what else can we possibly do? Several chances, in fact. Will that? be your final decision here? But since your mind is made up, the only course of action is for Ludger to ignore Julius, flip out, and attack his party of allies, as numerous as they are totally baffled by this turn of events. Knock it off! Oh good, this sick cutscene will take care of the nasty business of killing my friends for me, you might have thought, you fool before the game plunged you into an enormous actual battle with all your party members together. Like a car park brawl at closing time, but everyone has anime powers. And only when you have killed literally everybody are you treated to a definitive downer ending, wherein Julius reminds you the world is still doomed and he's still going to die. So, nice one, hero. So, this was all in vain. Hey, at least you're covered in all the blood of your friends. I am Dr. Jonathan Reed. I am a vampire, born anew into an age of death and pestilence. While plotting factions close in around me, I am sworn to find the source of this epidemic. The best part about being a vampire is living forever. The only catch is, the haircut you have when you're turned into a vampire, that's your haircut forever. What about the drinking blood thing? This is the eternity that faces Jonathan Reed, a gentleman doctor with dope fades as immortal as he is, stalking the streets of interwar London amidst a terrible, possibly supernatural epidemic. The epidemic that has stricken London is not the Spanish flu. It is transmitted through the blood via violent biting. As Jonathan, you can go about your vampire business in any way you choose. You can refrain from killing even a single friendly Londoner, foregoing blood and experience points to redeem your terrible self. Or you can, you know, be an actual vampire, feeding on a modest selection of the living like so many blood-filled Capri Suns. <laughs> or if you're feeling extra, you can go kill crazy and murder every single citizen available to you. Death may be the most disappointing dish I have ever tasted. Turning each of the city's districts hostile along the way. This last one is a substantial job of work, not least because the irreversibly hostile districts are more packed with enemies than my high school reunion. <laughs> Only by scrupulously depopulating London and wading through enemy-filled streets do you begin to qualify for the game's elusive worst possible ending. <laughs> 
Even then, you have to also make the correct bad guy decisions. In particular, choosing to turn this vampire hunter into a vampire to punish him for, I guess, having a similar haircut to you. I'll make you a vampire. I'll make you one of us. Now you're both immortal looking like that, Jonathan. Think it through, man. Do all this, and at the end of the game, your highly dubious reward is the bleakest of all the game's finales, in which your vampiric beloved Elizabeth says there's nothing left to live for and walks lethally backwards into a fire. Farewell. And then Jonathan, unrepentant, exports his killing spree to pre-war Paris, having shed the last of his humanity to live on as a bloodthirsty monster. You've chosen your path, my fallen champion, like others before you. Which is bad, mostly for the people of Paris. When we evaluate the secret bad ending of Dead Space Remake, we first have to consider the regular ending that everyone already gets that is, in a word, pretty bad. Two words. Isaac Clarke having killed countless necromorphs created by the alien obelisk known as the Marker, and having destroyed the insidious hive mind, makes it onto a shuttle. Here he mournfully watches an old video message from his girlfriend Nicole, who is, we have learned, deader than Disco, which itself has been dead at this point for over 500 years. I think it's me. Oh, I wish I could talk to you. Then he turns off the video message just in time for this ordinary run-of-the-mill ending that you get for simply finishing the game. I wish I was just talk to someone. Far from a good ending, I think you'll agree. For the elusive alternate ending that's new to the Dead Space remake, however, you're going to have to complete Dead Space once, for starters, and then in your new playthrough, take pains to collect each one of the 12 marker fragments scattered throughout the game. So, hope you like collectibles. Late in the game, with all 12 items in hand, fragment-collecting enthusiast Isaac must make his way to the office of Captain Matthias, where he'll find a ritual altar with a model of the marker surrounded by candles, like a particularly grim 12th birthday cake. By expending the considerable effort to collect and install the 12 marker fragments, you confirm that Isaac has gone a little bit strange under the influence of the marker, thereby unlocking the secret extra bad ending. Damn it, Isaac! You don't know what you're doing! I know you don't understand the marker like I do. In this version of the ending, Isaac still escapes thrillingly at the last second, but as we see him preparing for his onward journey, it's clear all is not well. Are we going home, Isaac? There's so much work to do. Soon, I promise. Gotta build a little something first. Not only is he chatty it up with the marker-induced hallucination of his dead girlfriend like it's no big deal, but his whole shuttle is daubed with the unwholesome finger painting of someone whose mind is fully hostage to the marker. But I think you're gonna like it. Usually, I like to get something nice when I collect all the collectibles. Like maybe a hat? Just a suggestion. You have inherited the frenzied flame. A pity. You are no longer fit. Our journey together ends here. None of the endings of Elden Ring are what you would describe as easy, except the one where you move in with the Pope Turtle and choose a new life of peace and tranquility. You are free to show yourself around. I mean, it's not an official ending. It's official to me! However, anyone who's gone far, far out of their way to achieve this particular ending of Elden Ring, in which everything is on fire, especially you, will tell you it is as hard as a diamond bastard. But if you are determined to reject your shot at becoming Elden Lord and ally yourself with the heretical, destructive chaos of the frenzied flame, then buckle up, Tarnished, because you're in for the ride of your many, many lives. 
assuming you've done the various arcane prerequisite bits and pieces and battled your way to the royal capital, your path begins below Landell in the entirely optional and extremely missable subterranean shunning grounds, also known as the sewers. Nothing good ever happened in a sewer level, and it's not about to start here, so please enjoy a boss fight with Moog the Omen, which isn't too hard, but also a bunch of platforming bullshit, which will make you want to eat your own face. Even reaching this parkour hellhole requires a special effort, given that the whole area is optional and obscure, and as you hop from ledge to fiddly ledge, you'll say to yourself, boy, I hope this is worth it. The truth is, nothing is worth this, but when you finally reach the lowest point, both of the sewers and your personal sense of well-being, you will be fully ready to commit yourself to the worst ending of the game. I didn't suffer all that platforming to not destroy the entire world, you say to yourself, then take off all your clothes and stride boldly onward to meet the three fingers. The nudity is required, by the way, it's not just for fun. Not this time. The three fingers are, surprise, three giant on fire fingers that give you a big flaming hug, scorching your poor nude bod like a sizzling fajita plate. Now, my friend, you've unlocked the frenzied flame ending, which is as far from a happily ever after as it's possible to get, as if you couldn't tell from the scorched flesh and your former pal Melina vowing to end you. Should you rise as the Lord of Chaos, I will kill you. Well, damn, but unless you go off and do an enormous, incredibly convoluted other quest to avoid it, the apocalyptic frenzied flame ending is the only one waiting for you at the end of the game. <laughs> In it, everything goes on fire, as promised, especially your own head, and the mystical life-giving Erd Tree is turned to ash, as the entire world is consumed by chaos. It's bad vibes. Looks like a terrible time for pretty much everyone, and in even worse news for you, Melina has survived the inferno and vows to track you down amidst the ruins of the world you destroyed. Which shouldn't be too hard, because you're the one with the on-fire head. I will seek you as far as you may travel. So yeah, good luck, buddy. Morgan, finally. Hey, you don't look terrible in a Transtar uniform. How's your eye? Still red? I know the test might seem a little unconventional, but it's a you family tradition. Breaking convention is in our blood. Once you start the test, just do whatever comes natural. In Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the number 42 is proposed as the answer to life, the universe and everything. It's also my preferred option at my local Chinese restaurant, but I'm 90% sure the two are unconnected. Eh, 85%. It is pretty delicious. 42 is also an important number in the game Prey, in that it's the total number of human survivors it's possible to encounter on Talos 1, a space station that has been attacked by shape-shifting aliens called Typhons. I expect my cup of coffee to wake me up, but that's ridiculous. 42 is also the number of human survivors it's possible to kill on Talos 1, if you're going to the effort of earning the game's unequivocal worst ending. Over the course of the game, you'll encounter various survivors, and choosing to help them improves the ending you receive. <gasps> breathe again. Did you see the size of that needle? If that ever happens to me, you let me die, okay? What's much harder to achieve than a good ending is actively seeking out and slaughtering every single survivor on the station, not least because some of these folks are armed and not ready to go gentle into that good night. Vital signs critical. It's literally always night in space. Why won't they go gentle? Into that. At the end of the game, it's revealed that your character Morgan Yu is actually a sort of Typhon-human hybrid with implanted memories, and that the entire game was a big empathy test, conducted by a group of scientists, including Morgan's older brother, Alex Yu. It's finished. If you were good and demonstrated compassion, you receive an option to work to unite humans and Typhons in an attempt to save both species. We're gonna shake things up, like old times. 
It is, however, a test that you emphatically fail if you go to the massive effort of stalking around the station murdering literally every human you can find. Activation of the mirror neurons was not promising. Empathy quotient shows to be almost non-existent. Almost non-existent? Oh no, did I, did I miss someone? Having failed the test with whatever the opposite of flying colours is, the experiment is deemed a failure, and this assembled group of scientists decides to terminate this Morgan U Typhon hybrid and start again. There's no question that every test, every juncture, it showed little to no identification with the crew or their suffering. What are we going to do? We failed. This isn't the one. Start over. So I'm sorry to say, you is dead. And you are dead. You and you is slash are dead. Yeah. I'm not gonna make a fancy speech. You all know what's at stake and what we're up against. If we don't stop the collectors, if we don't end it here and now, nobody else will. It's that simple. Let's go. Personally, I love Joker from Mass Effect. He's funny, he's a great pilot. He was the werewolf in Buffy the Vampire Slayer could go on. But there's no getting away from how the worst ending to Mass Effect 2 is the one where the literal only survivor is Jeff Joker Moreau because he's the only one who did make it to the final act of the game but didn't have to get off the ship and follow you to their death. To achieve this ending, which is as unhappy as it is gruelling, you have to willfully avoid recruiting companion characters wherever possible, and the few companions you do recruit, you need to actively avoid doing their companion quests, carefully picking your way through the game to make progress towards the finale, but without earning the loyalty of any of the poor suckers on your ship. This isn't how we planned this mission. But this is where we're at. And it's not hard work per se to refuse to upgrade the Normandy at all, but you do have to imagine your disloyal companions are judging you behind your back for cheaping out on shields and the like. Especially Joker. I'm glad you're in charge. What's next? Thusly unprepared and unsupported by your crew, you have to jump to the finale of the game, then disembark with your mutinous companions and painstakingly choose each wrong option along the branching path towards the conclusion. Callie. And when I say wrong option, I mean the option that gets each and every party member killed one at a time, like they all survived the same plane crash and now they're being final destinationed. Garrett! This culminates in a white knuckle scene where Shepard, having gotten everyone else killed, makes an epic leap to reach the fleeing Normandy fails to make it aboard, then Joker tries as hard as he can, but can't quite manage to pull Shepard to safety. Or at least that's what he'll tell management later. Joker, go. Commander! Shepard! This makes Joker the sole survivor of the mission and the ranking officer aboard the Normandy. Mr. Moreau, how is my ship? Feels a little empty, sir. So at least someone's having a good day. Congratulations on your promotion. I feel like someone turned me inside out twice. It's a little difficult to move now. That's because we've got gravity. Planet-type gravity. We're not inside the asteroid anymore. And the pressure is equalized. There's an atmosphere. If you don't remember 1995 point-and-click adventure game The Dig, it's basically the answer to the question, what if LucasArts made a point-and-click game but took out all the jokes? As you all know, she's a candidate for Congress, but we figured saving the planet is more important than campaigning. It's cheaper, too. <laughs> all right, all the funny jokes. In the dig, you're Boston Lowe, the leader of a crew of three astronauts who end up transported to a distant, far-flung alien planet with a conveniently breathable atmosphere. What are the chances of that? I believe the word is astronomical. Over the course of the story, your little squad discovers mysterious crystals that hold the key to bringing the dead back to life. The only problem is, as you discover when team member Ludger Brink dies and is resurrected using one, they're extremely addictive. I said give them to me! To be fair, I would also describe myself as quite addicted to not being dead. There's no doubting that Brink becomes a real jerk once he gets hooked on the life-giving crystals, and as a result, the remaining member of the team, Maggie Robbins, extracts a promise from you. 
What's the promise? If I die and you live, don't use any life crystals on me. Don't revive me. Do you understand? Are you sure? I saw what Brink became. I don't want that to happen to me. Sure enough, when Maggie activates a machine called the Eye to open a portal that will ultimately offer a ticket back to Earth, she ends up making the ultimate sacrifice. No, not everyone seeing every embarrassing thing she ever typed into Google search, but death. Maggie! Maggie, you liar! You knew this would happen. Yes, much worse, I assume. At the point when Maggie reveals to you there's a chance she could die, you can head all the way back to grab a crystal to resurrect her, thus breaking your promise. But it's fair to say Maggie takes this betrayal of her trust pretty badly. Oh no! Lo! I begged you! You have to admit, that was pretty low. Even for someone called Boston Low. Either way, in the ending, Maggie is resurrected properly, but if you broke your promise, instead of the lovely, heartwarming reunion of the good ending, Boston receives a richly deserved slap across the face. Maggie, when you died, I... Man, I'm glad to see you. Just rub a little life crystal on that, it'll be fine. I don't know if I'm glad to see you, Boston. You broke your promise to me. That's it, that's your lot. Thanks for watching this video about the bad endings that were even harder work than the good ending that also probably took you like 20 or 30 hours more? Probably 40? More. 100 hours? More you never know with these open world games, do you? Um, thanks for watching and if you'd like to support this channel, do check out the Patreon here. You can get involved with the um, exclusive channel Discord. And if you'd like to watch something else by us, I'm not even going to recommend you two videos today. I'm going to recommend you one video because I'm calling it. It's a cool shot. This is the one that's going to make your day apart from the one that you just watched. You should watch this one video right now. You don't even have to and do the hard work of choosing between two Don't videos. even choose. It's here. It's, it's, there's something here, but also this one. What is it? I don't, I don't know. <laughs>